Welcome to Houston Newsmakers Extra. I'm with Ed Cottom and Sam Collins III. We've been talking about the history of Juneteenth, and we, we were talking on the program about uh, General Granger. And let's talk about him for a minute because his name is most often associated with the general orders that are signed there. But I, as I've looked in other history, and I think you refer to it as well in your book, General Granger really had very little to do with what happened on Juneteenth. He had very little to do with what happened on Juneteenth. And, you know, he's gotten this reputation of being, you know, some sort of a civil rights pioneer, and nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, during the war, very early in the war, when uh, slaves would escape and come to his army, he gave them back to the slave owners. When he was in Alabama, he sent a letter to the president attaching a petition by a bunch of Alabama slaveholders uh, wanting to come back in the Union f and basically keep their government intact. He, that reputation for uh, being somehow the friend of, of black people is completely undeserved. Well, I saw as well that after his duty station, and it was very short-lived in Galveston, he didn't stay there very long. He just kind of came there and then it was pretty much done after that. Yes, uh, Ulysses Grant hated General Granger. And this, this went back many, many years uh, from the time when he was actually serving under Grant. And he had this, this reputation for being a loose cannon. And I mean that in the classic sense of the word. When he was supposed to be doing things with his troops, they would find he had wandered off, he was fascinated with artillery pieces, and he would practice loading and firing cannon. And this made Grant furious, and he just basically cashiered him out of his part of the army, and he ended up wildly down in Galveston. Sam, <laughs> that's kind of amazing history. Sam, talk about the, what has drawn you into this anyway. This is the passion. You're an investment guy. That's what you do for a living. You help people make their investments, and you know about that part. But you have really embraced this. I've read your, re your, your writings for many years now. What is it that drew you into it and keeps you passionate about it? Well, one is to help expand this narrative around the fact that the former enslaved and some of the freed uh, blacks helped to fight for their own freedom. So individuals like William Costley, who was actually one of the first enslaved individuals freed by Abraham Lincoln, and people don't understand that dates back to 1841 when he helped his mother, Nance Leggins Costley, win her freedom. Mm -hmm. And Costley at that time was only two years old in 1841, but he grew up, was part of the Union Army, the 29th Regiment from Illinois, and he was in Galveston in June of 1865. So this is an important piece of the story that is, is left out that these United States colored troops have also been very active in helping the Union to win the Civil War and to save America. See, I noticed on the mural there, there's a picture of, and I don't know if that's general depicting whoever is sitting, but there are, quote, colored troops behind him. And that's a shot there. So that's a depiction of, of their presence there that we don't often hear about. Yeah, just in, in the narrative of American history, often the contributions of uh, minorities, whether it's African Americans, the Native Americans, Hispanics, are left out of the story. And all of us have contributed to this American exceptionalism that we uh, so pride ourselves, but they're not a part of the story. So I intentionally asked the initial artist, Chase Sampe, who get, did the initial sketch, to have Granger sitting and the st soldiers standing as men, freedom fighters, and patriots. Uh, so in the uh, mural, you'll see Granger is actually signing General Order Number 1 because he did not, as Ed has already said, s sign General Order Number 3, 4, or 5. Very, very clever. <laughs> very clever. Talk about what it took, how long it took from 1865. Now, we went from 1865. We had Reconstruction later on. That was a, a, an experiment. Basically, it turned out to be an experiment. It could have been something, but it really didn't work like it was intended to be. Talk about how long it took for slaves' freedom to actually translate into something that was meaningful for that group of folk who were finding out they were now free. Yeah, the experience of being emancipated was very different for different people. Uh, a lot of these former slaves were interviewed in the 20s and 30s and talked about their experience being emancipated. and. It was, it was not a surprise to them. They knew that this was coming because there were informal communication networks around that had pretty well spread the fact that emancipation was coming. 
but I don't think anybody really knew what that would mean. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one fellow who I quote in the book says, uh, we knew freedom would make us happy, but we knew it would, we didn't know it wouldn't make us rich. Mm -hmm. and, and that economic change was something that would play out very differently all across the state and be very confusing and complex. And Sam, I noticed too on the orders that in addition to say, the, the, we focused on the part that says all free, but they also said, you know, you're going to now, instead of, you, you, the basic point was, don't get up and leave. You got to stay where you are and now work for the person who used to be your master, except now is a, your employer. And don't loiter and don't come near the post where <laughs> yeah. we are, you know. So yeah. that, it was not just your free congratulations. There was a lot more to that. Yeah, uh, the freedmen are advised to remain at their present homes. And many of the uh, freedmen then took on the status as employees, and employees had to have a pass from the employer to move. Mm. So this complicated issues uh, pretty much like a slave pass. Uh, but now, uh, if they were caught without a pass, uh, they could be arrested. And that happened in many places, as, as Ed talked about, it's different. Uh, circumstances in different areas so it wasn't just drop your tools and run off and find your loved ones because where were they going to go they didn't own the land at the time and they had right. to have individuals that were willing to sell land to them and give them uh, uh, opportunity to start building communities which in the 50 years between 1865 and 1915 they built schools churches communities 1867 settlement Freedmanstown Kennelton there are territories and areas that are still exist today mm -hmm that were established as Freedman Towns. So you talk about this, so that you, you had to have a pass or you could be arrested. That was kind of the precursor to the convict leasing, was it not? I mean, that same kind of attitude was that you could arrest somebody for almost nothing and then kind of make them pay their way out and they probably could ever pay their way out. Yeah, and in the contracts there in Galveston, at the Galveston, Texas and History Center, there are contracts, and in the contracts it says the convicts to be provided by uh, this contract shall be Negroes. So it was written into the contract that mm. they were trying to arrest certain individuals. So when you had public uh, projects, say, like building the Capitol in Austin, they would have arrested more men because they needed that labor and they would have put them on those jobs. And not only there at the Capitol, but other uh, uh, jobs uh, throughout the state. So Ed, you've written about history in Texas and you, you know this through and through. And right now there is a push from some to kind of edit history a little bit. It's a sensitive topic to a lot of people about what we should talk about as far as history is concerned. What are your thoughts about how we should talk about history as it is, good, bad, and ugly, because there's a lot of it that's great for this state, but there's a lot of it that we need to look at and say acknowledge that it happened. I, I agree with that. I think that uh, basically we need to, the first thing we need to do is really understand what happened, the physical facts, where it happened, how it happened, what, it hap what happened, who did it. And then once we get the facts established, we can start a conversation around those facts. And this is a continuing conversation. Uh, I think back, I, I've probably given more Civil War tours of Galveston than anybody ever. And in the old days, decades ago, I would come by uh, the vacant lot where the building was that uh, General Granger's headquarters occupied. And I would point that out and I would say, this is where Juneteenth happened and explain that event but there was no signage, there was nothing about it. Then in 2014, my friend Sam Collins here uh, got a group together and they put up the uh, historical marker that's there now. And this Juneteenth, we're going to uh, have this gigantic, colorful, beautiful mural there on the site of the Osterman building where this headquarters was. So gradually, Kimberly, I think we're coming to a recognition that this is really important history. This is, this is the commemoration of emancipation, one of the pivotal events in American history. And we're now starting to recognize that, monument it, mark it, and talk about it. In Sam, what do you want people to take away from Juneteenth and the celebration, what it means and what it should mean to everybody as they at least learn about it? Anyone that values uh, freedom, uh, independence, uh, if you celebrate the 4th of July, you should celebrate the freedom birthday of June 19, 1865, which was a freedom birthday for the former enslaved. We should celebrate from June 19 to July 4th. As we do this work to repair our country, this American house we live in, we tell these stories, is to do the repair work so that future generations don't have to deal with the problems of the past or the present. 
So the foundation is cracked because we haven't told the complete story. There's bad wiring in the house. There's bad plumbing. But this uh, effort is to repair the foundation, rewire the house, replumb it so that generations in the future don't have to deal with what we're dealing with today. Well, I appreciate all that you're doing with the project, the Legacy Project and Ed Cottom Jr., your book, Juneteenth, the story behind Juneteenth. We love that. I, 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 you got to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. You, you got to pick that up. So thank you both for coming in. We appreciate it. This is Houston Newsmakers Extra. Share this with everybody you know.